Thank you. Good morning. Welcome to Chicago. Hopefully you're having a bit of fun in Chicago. I love the town. I live 25 miles west of here, come in by train, which makes it, uh, as I said, a lot easier to, to get in. Uh, today, talking about uh, the presentation of 4G as a disruption, I'm very happy to see, finally, after being in wireless broadband for the past 10 years, first with a proprietary system called Canopy, then in WiMAX, and now LTE, finally seeing results out of LTE. Look at the results of the operators. If you look at Verizon, AT&T, Telstra's presentation yesterday, what you find is they're making money, increasing share. Why? This is the biggest change in wireless data in 10 years, or more, or ever. This is a gold rush. As a marketing person, I will tell you, if you're an operator, first to market is a huge advantage. And you're seeing it in the numbers. If you haven't looked at the numbers, look at the numbers, give yourself that advantage. The people that are moving are winning. And they're doing it not because it's not a great technology, they're doing it because users love it. When you love it, you look at things like 3G and you say, 3G works for me, it's a tool. I use it as a business tool. As such, I get my email, I can find the things I need. But LTE adds a wireline-like experience, not close, but getting there, in terms of what it's able to do. So that experience when I talk to people that are using LTE, love it. So that's what we're talking about today when I say it's a disruption. And to go into disruption, other types of areas about disruption, what we did this time is instead of being a box-led vendor and lead the conversation with the way we want to do it, we used crowdsourcing to come up with the agenda today. We got people to tweet in and talk about what are the big topics still out there. I was surprised to find the expertise of the people that asked the questions still asking very simple questions. When you see a call out box in any of the slides, that means it's actually one of the tweets that came in that is asking a question. There are several, there are five, I believe, in this presentation. If it came in as a bird, it's a tweet. If it came in as a mail icon, obviously it's mail. Uh, Wim came up with this idea, thought it was a great idea, and I encourage you to continue the conversation because of the social networks today, to go ahead and use Pound Hello 4G anytime you want to bring other interesting topics in, not just today, but also in the future. Because that's really what drives us forward, makes these presentations interesting. It's about the results, where people are going, and about the innovation. So feel free to use this, and we'd love to hear from you. If you look at one of the things we, we received, it's 4G is great, except when it isn't there. So people that are on 4G and understanding what that experience is like, notice it when it's not there. There's also the big impact of when you don't have broadband, the digital divide. And back in the early days, uh, in a proprietary system called Canopy, I was delighted to find that as we got to the rural markets, DSL couldn't reach, cable wasn't there, and people were thrilled to be able to get online through wireless broadband it made a big difference in their lives because they felt connected to the rest of the community and the world. So you look at the demand on the one side and you look at the other, the first picture. When I presented light radio in 2011 at Mobile World Congress and I would talk to sea levels and I'd talk about how much pain is it when you're in the city and you're trying to get, talk to that city council about adding a cell tower or onto rooftops. One CEO says, I get five letters a week complaining about towers. So how do you provide great performance and experience when in a data world, the farther you're away from the antenna, the slower you go? Huge problem. So through innovation, we're able to take care of some of these things and move it forward. We'll talk about that. But no one wants an antenna or a power plant in their backyard. That's for sure. The second is the impact. When you look at the number of base stations out there, three million plus base stations, and the amount of consumption, power consumption, is amazing. I heard one stat out of Bell Labs that said over 90% of the energy that goes in is wasted. And as I, was, as I was trying to describe this to my kids, we were driving down the road past the tower. I said, you see the little brown hut? At the bottom of that little brown hut is an amplifier. 
And amplifiers are not 100% efficient. And I hadn't really thought about it before, but you talk about the power in, the power going up, and I said they lose half the power between that amplifier and the antenna, half. So if I want to put 60 watts up above, I've got to put 120 watts in down below, and it's not 100% efficient. It's somewhere in amplifiers, somewhere between 25 and 40%, depending on the technology. You have tremendous waste. So how do we improve that? Because as a society, no one wants that power plant in their backyard. We're all using fossil fuels, and of course, you all know where that's going, right? So you're looking at crossing the divide, and, and also the, the people here that you see on the right, they can be using that for commerce. Is it getting information to solve a problem? Is it showing a picture of what you have so that you can do better commerce? And I know this from firsthand experience because I grew up in central Illinois and I had two uncles that were farmers. My one uncle passed away and after the funeral I went back to the farmhouse with my aunt. This was in 1990. And do you remember in 1990 people were talking about putting broadband in, wired broadband? And they were talking about, you're gonna need this in the urban areas, you're not gonna need it in the rural areas. You know, the farmers don't need it. I walked into the farmhouse and on the kitchen table was a terminal. And on there was all the stats about all the agricultural information you could ever want in color. I said, what is that for? They said, well, Tom, we, when we, we have the grain in the elevators and we want to sell it, we want to sell it at the right market prices. So you can bet your boots they need data everywhere. And it doesn't matter whether it's here in the US or some other country. Everyone needs it. So that's what we're really driving to. And to do that, what we did in 2011, we launched a new architecture called Light Radio. Now, I'm not here to talk to you about a light radio. I'm here to talk about the innovation and the impact it had on other vendors and our industry. You quickly saw other vendors jump in with their own architectures. So NSN came in with liquid radio. That's kind of close, liquid radio, light radio, right? So they did that, why? Because it makes sense. And it makes sense because when you look at 4G and you look at the, what people want, you're today talking to a fraction of the people that actually want it. My son, 17, I gave him a phone. He hardly uses voice at all. I got more unused minutes than God. The second bit is he texts some, not like a lot of kids, but he texts some. I won't buy him the internet stuff. Why? It takes the price too high. So the people that are getting 3G services today or now LTE services, you're doing so, but you're only hitting the top market segment. As a marketing person, I'm always looking at how do I drive down into that next market segment. I've got to be able to do it by providing the capacity and a lower cost per bit. So when you look at what the architecture does, it keeps the gravy train rolling. Regardless of whether you're Alcatel, Lucent, or some other vendor, we're looking at ways to make this such that as an operator, you don't run out of bits. That's the important thing. It's not getting to market and winning and sitting there. This is a gold rush. It's also, how do I continue to get down to each additional market segment so that you can get to the mass market? So I can give it to my son and not worry about it. If you look at some of the things that are happening, just to give you a high level, integration, and it's all vendors doing this, integration of the chipsets. So SOC, right, combines a lot of the DSP processing, brings it all into a single chip, makes it smaller, lighter, cheaper, faster. The second is when we take the, the cube, what we've done is we, we push the antennas and the amplifiers right into that cube that you see. When we put them up there, we don't have that power loss. When you don't have the power loss, you're winning from an operational standpoint as well as an efficiency standpoint. The cloud, two aspects of cloud. Someone said it yesterday, there are multiple types of clouds. There's private clouds. So if I do a cloud RAN, that's what we've talked about in light radio, a cloud RAN, that's one type. But think about something else. Today, and I saw a Google stat that said 80% of people's content will reside in the cloud within the next three or four years. The performance of the user experience is going to be driven by the network, the performance of the network. So the networks, if you're an operator providing a tremendous experience and the user data lives in the cloud, their whole experience, you'll get blamed for it one way or the other, is all driven by how well they, that experience is. We all know from a technical standpoint that you know your, your bottleneck, wherever it is, is your limiting factor. So if my data is, is sourced somewhere else, then that becomes the bottleneck. You can't solve that problem, but what you can control is that RF link, that access layer, and the capacity thereof. Does, so this was a tweet, LTE is insanely fast, faster than Wi-Fi, the heart of the matter. So when you provide this great performance, it's not just the network, but when you look at the devices, the tablets, the iPhone 5, iPhone 5 processing increased by two times. The performance stats are what you're seeing between an iPhone 5, between 3G and LTE, 
And when I looked at it 3G to 3G, they sent me the information, it's still two to three times faster because of the processing in the phone itself. Samsung was here talking about it, I'm sure they know and they can tell you the same thing. So when you look at the volume increase, and here they said 20% volume increase per day and some smart person said, well wait Tom, they just got their phone, they're gonna download their apps. That's true. But at the same time, the, I can tell you as a marketing person, the better the experience, the more you'll rely on it as a tool, the more you'll use it. When you do that, you're gonna see these volumes increase. The prediction is volumes will increase. Everyone's just looking to understand better where that comes from. So packet loss is about efficiency of your spectrum. That drives down cost per bit. Latency is about the end user experience, right? I hit the button, I get a response immediately. And then of course speed, once I'm getting something, right? How quickly can I get it? Lesson learned from the deployments. This is what I referenced early on. When you talk about increasing market share, if you're a large operator, is 3% share significant? Everyone said, well, yeah, that's really big, especially in the days of this kind of competition. So running and grabbing and getting into LTE first, you'll have the biggest chance of success. Driving down the cost, when you look at, at LTE, one of the questions that got, got tweeted in, I couldn't believe it, they said, is there really still a, a business model been found for 4G? Wow. It's a flat IP architecture. It's just simply more efficient. It's all IP, it's flatter, the operational costs are less. So 4G was the first time your business model changed from, an op, from a CapEx to an OpEx business model. So it's about your leasing, your sites, it's about your backhaul, those are your big costs. ARPU, a lot of different uh, uh, areas of ARPU that are, make it very interesting, and that is that people are providing more bits but they're also charging more for it and consumers are good with that. So you're seeing ARPU go up. So these sound like winning factors. And you're looking at how do you keep that going? Again, look at that architecture, look at the things you can do. So if you're saying keep the gravy train going, one of the tweets that came in really talks about spectrum. Two areas that we're talking about here. So is it really worth deploying massive small cell layer with 3G and 4G small cells when there's plenty of Wi-Fi around? Answer is yes. Um, as an operator, you'll probably tell me, and I believe, you'll never have enough capacity. If you have enough capacity, you can drive your and drive your costs down, you can get to the point where you can reach your mass market. Number two, having been in this business for a long time, Wi-Fi is unlicensed spectrum. I can tell you something, I don't know if you know this or not, but money men do not like risk. Go try to get a loan if you're gonna put in a Wi-Fi network. They will not touch it. Last I knew, they would not touch it because there's too much risk. Anyone can put up a Wi-Fi point, crank up some you know, wattage in the cottage, big antenna, they'll take you off the air. So Wi-Fi, and money men don't get along. Wi-Fi is great because every device has Wi-Fi in it and you can get it at hot spots. You don't have the contiguous coverage. So we'll talk about some of this later today in one of the panels, right? And Heg's here from Wireless 2020. We've talked about this. When you talk about Wi-Fi, it's great because I can go from point to point and I can get on and get off. There's carrier grade Wi-Fi now that makes it easier for the end user to get on, more secure, and I hear about Wi-Fi offloading my view is Wi-Fi onloading because it's my customer. I want to keep him on my network and I want to control that experience as long and as far as I can. So Wi-Fi itself won't do it and there's some inherent risk and it's not contiguous coverage. So 3G, 4G, continuous coverage, spend a lot of money on the spectrum, you own that spectrum. So very positive thing. If you look at, at where we're going with, with uh, capacity, uh, Wi-Fi onload, 3G small cells and 4G small cells, Small cells is a way to add the capacity into a sector, right? So you're using every tool that you can to add capacity to a network. Getting to LTE, obviously that's a big one. And then RAN sharing. I didn't look at RAN sharing as something that really helps the spectrum, but people are talking a lot about RAN sharing from an operational cost perspective. If we look at the spectrum issue, and I break that out, at one point, um, Bell Labs said, well, average across the planet, across everyone's network, not just the dense urban, but on average, 25X growth by 2016. I don't know about you, 20, 25 times growth, 25 times what? So I'm gonna walk you through my example of this and I'll see if I can be clear. If I look today at having three carriers of 3G, five megahertz a piece, my engineers tell me I can get four megabits per sector, average sector throughput. So four times three is 12. So 12 megabits per second is what you're getting today 
just as my baseline. If I multiply by that 25, I get 300 megabits per second. So by 2016, I need to have that kind of capacity, 300 megabits per second. If I take a small cell and I use the tools I have, 3G, 4G, and Wi-Fi, take one carrier of 3G, I take full 20 megahertz of LTE if I can, and then Wi-Fi, which is also based on the technology today going to give you 20 megahertz, but basically 12 megabits per second, uh, uh, 12 and four. Actually, it's 24, 24, and, and 12. So you get 52 megabits per metro cell that you can put in for capacity, 52 megabits. So if I could put 10 of those in a sector, right? If I put 10 of those in a sector, I'm using all my spectrum. I've got spectrum availability coming in different countries. So best I can do is double the amount of spectrum I have as an operator today, looking at it long term. My spectral efficiency can go up, so I can get to three times that number. And the spatial efficiency, taking those metro cells, 52 megabits per second each one, I can go up by 10 times because I can put 10 of them per sector. That's what Bell Labs tells me is a, is a kind of maximum number. And you're gonna put them at the cell edge. Now, this is something I haven't heard a lot of people talk about that I'm talking about internally. And what I say is, look guys, when I put small cells at the edge, two things are gonna happen. Not only am I providing a lot of capacity, I'm providing a fabulous experience because I am closer to the antenna. So when, talk, when we talk about all these great speeds and we're all in the speed wars and how much, how much we got, we're talking about standing right next to the antenna. We're usually talking about a single UE. However, that's not what you deal with as operators out in the real world. What you're dealing with are people at the edge where you have the most of them. So now you can take, add the capacity and add, be able to provide them that fifth gear type speed, that five bar type speed and coverage. So when I look at that, that's 30X, and I haven't factored in the Wi-Fi, so when I factor in the Wi-Fi, you could actually, between uh, 5 gig and 2.4 and AC, you could now actually take that 30 times and make it 60 times. That's how we're going to keep up with the capacity necessary to keep the gravy, gravy train rolling. Another one of the tweets that came in, sound and multi-vendor het nets, can it actually work? I'm the marketing guy. So the technology guys, when I talk to them, say, it's technically possible. You can do this. Great. Why do you want to do this? Today, there are two stories. One story is, hey, if you have our macro, put in our metro. Because it's going to make sense. It's going to give you peace of mind. The problem with that is you're now constrained to one vendor. Competition is what drives down your prices. So we can give you the capacity, but if I don't drive down the cost per bit, you can't get to them mass market people that you want to. So it's going to make sense to go ahead and work on IoT, because the standards bodies for 4G were very smart. They put the standards in, they put the specs in, but what we have to agree on is the IoT. I'm an incumbent vendor in North America, and I still favor this because it's the right thing to do to keep the cost per bit down to actually get broadband to the masses. So think about it as an operator. You've got to drive that conversation through your RFPs and through your vendor management. Now, this is where some of the, the, the fun stuff comes in. Is there a business model for 4G? Um, if you look at how people do things today, I'll look at a market, Chicago market. And if you look at the offerings, it's the same offering across the entire market. But we all know that there are different neighborhoods and different areas within the city and within the suburbs. So if you look at their needs and wants, those needs and wants can vary. So if you take today and look at the types of things people are doing, it's not just these, but it's a lot of things. It's business efficiency tools. Um, it's getting information like when I first get up in the morning, am I looking at weather? Did the stock market open? Um, what's the train schedule? Is there traffic? Things that are efficiency tools. There's also things like this that are talking about YouTube and what, what, what do I want to enjoy on Netflix? All these things are happening, but the, the model has to change. And one of the biggest changes that's happened has been the shared data plan. That's a terrific thing because I wouldn't buy a separate data connection for my son on his phone, or either of my sons. But if there was a shared data plan, this now makes a lot of sense because I can now understand what I'm spending on a monthly basis. And that's what most consumers are gonna to wanna to do. They need to understand it in terms they can understand. And I think I heard someone say a gigabyte. How do I know when I get to a gigabyte? I don't even know when I get to a gigabyte.
Okay, we're in the industry. Probably most of you can't tell either. So the majority want to understand what that is. And so those models, is there a business model for 4G? There is, but you need the flexible tools to enable you to do things like real-time stats of what's happening in your network. Now, let me give you a quick example. Back in the day, they did drive testing. When you start and ask, well, what did they do? They drove in a car down the middle of the street. They took the stats of what the network coverage was like. Today, as an operator, one of the problems that you have is that drive testing now needs to be everywhere, in the buildings, because people aren't using it as a car phone anymore, right? Long has that passed. What they're using it for is their device that's always in their hand. It's almost an extension. So if you look at that, the drive test of today means that I have to have information about what's happening in their hand, what's the device, that complexity went way up, what's the application, because today if you look at one of these servers from one of these providers here, if they're having a problem with an overload, the operator will get blamed for it. Has nothing to do with the wireless network. Has to do with that server. So what tools can we give the operator to understand what's happening all the time, in real time, in their network? Once you have that, you have the tools and the mechanisms then to look at how can I change the value of the bits going over the air. So the value of the bits going over the air means I can do new and interesting things like zero rating. If it's an ad and I'm working on all types of different mobile advertising, it could be that I give this information to you free of charge. There's the shared data plan that I mentioned, QoS based. QoS based is probably one of the areas I see a lot of potential in. And I'll tell you why. Because people have spectrum and spectrum performs different, right? The low band versus the high band. Low band gives me good penetration. So let's say that Hag and I are in the bar tonight and we want to watch a game, right? And it's a game out of the East Coast that's not being shown here. So we sit in the bar, we pull out a tablet, we pull out a laptop, it really doesn't matter. We're willing to spend $20 for that time to watch the game because that's the way we can get it. Now, with the layers that you have in the network, Wi-Fi, 3G, and 4G, the control mechanisms are soon to be there that would allow our service provider to say, these are very valuable bits, I'm getting $20 for two hours, these are the most valuable bits I'm going to get today. And what you can do is then direct the traffic over, say, 700 megahertz to make sure that we get a good experience. Those types of tools and things will allow the operator the flexibility, like yield management. So Wall Street, middle of the day, bits going over the air, high value bits. It's Wall Street. What are those bits worth at 6 o'clock when there's crickets? So yield management could be, hey, if I've got Tom's son walking down the street and wants to get that experience, it's not costing you anything to provide that experience and there's hardly anyone there, you can do that. So yield management can be new ways of entertaining when of those bits have the most value and where am I? If I look at Chicago and go back to my market segment, I want to be able as a marketing person to get down to micro segments. I want to understand the area around Wrigley Field called Wrigleyville where the demographics are very similar. You have people that have more, they're more affluent, they're very hip with technology, and when you look at what they're doing, you can actually say, can I serve that area uniquely? Because when they get up at eight o'clock in the morning and go to work, the things that they're doing are email and checking weather and transit and all those things. Why let someone that's going to do YouTube or video at eight o'clock in the morning ruin the experience for what the masses want. So the future holds some very, very interesting things because we've got the control mechanisms, you've got the measurement techniques, and you've got the means to provide the capacity and lower the cost per bit. So disrupt or be disrupted, right? It's up to you. Drive people forward, drive your vendors forward, drive the thinking forward. And with that, have a great day and a good rest of the show. Thank you. Tom, do you mind uh, answering a few questions? No, be glad to. Very good. So uh, I'm very interested in light radio and how you're changing the paradigm of a base station. Um, in that context, though, we're still going to have macros, and we're still going to have towers, even though I don't want it in my backyard. So don't think about that. Right. Uh, on the other hand, we're going to have them in a lot of other places. But you know. 
the real estate associated with those other places hasn't been organized for this purpose. Uh, maybe in some venues it has been, but on my street, for example, the utilities took the initiative to create a right-of-way to allow them to put wires on poles and run down every street. By the way, I happen to have no electricity on my street now, and no <laughs> telephone, no cable service, so you know my people are sitting in the dark. But for, for wireless, it's a little different. Why, haven't the wireless, why hasn't the wireless industry created the kinds of right-of-way enablements that allow them to bring the wireless network down to street level, down to pe where people are, rather than up on a tower? Uh, that's a great question. And I may not be right. There's probably more expertise in this room than me, but I'll give you my opinion. Um, in the early days, you're always looking for coverage, and voice was a coverage game. Right? In voice, and I describe it to my family this way, voice operates no matter how far I am from the tower, I get a voice connection until I get to the cell edge and I get to the next cell. Data world, it's like going up a mountain, I tell them. So you're on the flat land, you're in fifth gear, you're going great, you're getting all the speed, and then you start to get farther and farther away, it's like going up the, the hill. And you've got to go down to fourth gear, third gear, to second gear. You're still going, you're still going to get there, but you're not getting there as fast. So to bring the antennas down closer to the consumer is what's going to promote the great experience always from a broadband perspective. So when you look at it, that hasn't been what the industry has done until now. Small cells, if you look at it, I'm in a house that is actually down a hill, and there's a, a big mound of, of earth with a house on it across the street from me, and then a lot of trees. So talk about a tough environment. So I went out and picked up a um, small cell, a uh, uh, femto cell. And so I have that in my house, and it's great because it uses my broadband, but I take my work phone and I can get everything I need and get that experience right then and there. So I don't have to have them add more, particularly in a neighborhood, in that situation. Now, so is that a data femto or a voice femto? It's both. Oh, good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So do you have Wi-Fi in your house? I do. How does it get there? How does it get there? DSL. DSL. So yep. the phone company brought a wire. Yep. It's copper. Yep. And in fact, it's enabled for high speed to give you the Wi-Fi experience you're looking for. That's right. But that Wi-Fi experience also connects to your phone. Yep. How about when you walk down the street and take a walk in your neighborhood? Ah, you bring up something very interesting. Um, it doesn't, right, today, because you need carrier grade Wi-Fi and the tools to do that. But it reminds me of um, a couple, um, a great story. There was a, a woman that was helping us out, you know, pick some color carpeting or whatever, and she came to the house. and. Um, she had her iPad and she said, I don't, I don't understand. She said, I, you know, I use it to, to find directions. I'm at home and I Googled your house and I found it. And I get in the car and I'm going down and I, I can't, it doesn't tell me where I am. And she didn't realize that Wi-Fi is a local area. She could see all the Wi-Fi access points popping up as she's driving. She didn't get a data plan for that iPad. She, did she? she, didn't, she didn't realize that she needed a, she needed a 3G right, plan. People Something. still, someone said it yesterday, uh, they're still trying to figure out how to talk to consumers the right way so that they understand. She didn't understand that it was a 3G and a mobile network versus Wi-Fi. Because her, it's wireless. Now, when my son, my oldest son, was in fifth grade, so seven years ago, uh, we were going to, go, about this time of year, we were going up north to enjoy the colors. And he says, can I take the laptop, Dad? I have some homework to do. Sure. So we enjoy the weekend. We're driving home. And he pulls out the laptop. And he's, I see him back there, see him back there. And his face is all scrunched up. So what's the matter? He says, I can't get to the internet. Whoa, I didn't even, you know, we grew up with Wi-Fi. We understand. We're a technical community. But the people that don't understand that, right, are the ones really looking for the easy solution between to be able to go hop to hop, right? So carrier-grade Wi-Fi, when we talk about the Wi-Fi panel today, those are the things and the challenges. It's not those of us in the room that know what we're dealing with, right? It's the, it's the, the majority of people that need the help, and they don't need the frustration. So we had a very big deal that occurred a few months ago in the industry, in which uh, a bunch of spectrum was sold to Verizon, and another deal was cut so that the cable companies would partner with Verizon and make Verizon Wireless part of this uh, Wi-Fi ecosystem that they're creating. In fact, uh, anybody who Googles Xfinity uh, Wi-Fi, which is a Comcast site, will find that they have a huge Wi-Fi hotspot network covering the Northeast or at least they did before Sandy came, and hopefully it's still there. Uh, but from Philadelphia all the way up to Boston, and it's now moving 
west and heading toward Chicago. And in fact, we're going to have a whole session tomorrow devoted to Wi-Fi in the Chicago land area, which you may find quite interesting yes. yourself. Um, so in fact, uh, the cable industry kind of finally woke it up that Wi-Fi isn't something you create in your house, but it's something I hang on my strand. And it's now an enabler for mobile broadband service that is the gap between that tower and the end user when the end user is at the, at the cell edge or doesn't get the performance they're looking for or wants to be in the back seat of that car and do what they were doing in the house, right? So you think that's going to change? There's, there's a couple points that I like to, to bring up. Number one is wireless networks rely on a wireline network. Within an operator's network, when we talk about backhaul, that's controlled by the wireline side in most cases that I have found. So the wireline side, when you look at how do I get to all those places, it's not just a telco means of getting there. It can also be a cable company, right? There's, there's a symbiotic relationship that can occur because of the rights of way and where that, that strand goes, and you need that as backhaul. The second bit that's interesting is when we talk about small cells, and I asked, there's a lot of discussions around the OPEX and the, the backhaul. And I said to someone, I said, you know, if I was going to do cell splitting, I'm going to double my network and I've got to get backhaul to all those places. And if I'm doing it on the side of a building or the top of the building, the fiber's already in the building. So why is this so, so hard to overcome? What is the real problem? And uh, Mike Shables explained it to me this way. He says, you know what? He says, the fact that you're going on to lampposts and other places is new domain. And as such, you don't have the blueprint, the operational blueprint for who's the guy rolling the truck that has to get out and do the things they need to do, because they haven't done it at a lamppost. Not to mention get you electrical power up that lamppost. Exactly. So those are all the, so it's not the fact that they don't have to do it for other technologies. It's we have to create the breakthroughs to understand the environment. The Chicago example is a very good one because you look at it and you say, wow, 3G networks in some places are really, you know, hitting, hitting the, their capacity, right? They're running. How do you take the load off of a 3G network? If you have Wi-Fi, people can be on Wi-Fi and you can reduce your load on 3G. Now maybe I've got some capital budget to get LTE rolling, which further takes us off of 3G. Because 3G, look at it, is an, is an inefficient way of doing what LTE does. Right, in this core. It's just not as efficient, bit efficient, right? You look at the profit numbers and you see. So if you look at the way to get to, to market, right, and take the load off 3G, there's strategies that can be employed that, that include Wi-Fi and LTE, right, to get to that, you know, promised land. Great. We do have a question there. Mr. Bell. Hey, Tom. Good morning. Uh, Steve Bell from Kiso Global. Building on the comments of the different technologies, I think you introduced a very interesting aspect of the back end, which was tariff innovation, which is providing operators or carriers with the ability to, to change and uh, modify their, their tariff mechanisms. But there was an interesting point brought up on the, the last panel, which was that the mixing of tariffs creates a, a fear, which is in terms of, and you, I think you said yourself, what, how do you know when, what is a gigabyte? So do you see that the giving this in incre incremental innovation on the tariff side is actually, could actually be a barrier to further data adoption because people are fearful of uh, not being able to monitor it? Or how do you see people overcoming that? Yeah, I, that's a great question. Um, actually, it's a good question, not a great question. You know why it's a good question, not a great question? I have answers to the great questions, yeah. So, so the good questions are a little tougher. Um, there's a lot of trial and error. There's new things. It doesn't matter whether it was the railroads, you know, 150 years ago or 200 years ago. You know, they, they crashed and burned before they became successful. And in this case, you're not going to crash and burn, but you're going to have to try new things to see what, what your user population will do and what makes sense and how easy. One of the things that, that I think about as we talk about applications and moving forward is how fast can I change? So the systems of today, PCRF and all the other underlying functions have been very brittle. You put them in, you don't want to muck with them, right? But you're on the cusp of, of PCRF 2.0 and the other mechanisms that are coming about. They're going to allow you to actually trial some things and being able to test it and find out what your user base will do. Because the user base, as you pointed out, the scary, you know, who's afraid and who's not. If you take Wrigleyville, they're more tech savvy. You know, they may look at it and go, this is wonderful. And if you get to another area of Chicago, they may may look at it and go, I don't know what to do with this. So. Well, thank you so much, Tom. Thank you thank for you a great very much. presentation. Thank you.